name is Charles Hunter Smart and we are on the Bradwell Grove Estate uh, just south of Burford, Oxfordshire. Going back uh, a few years to about 2016-17 um, we were looking at our farming business. Uh, I managed the estate for a family and uh, we were looking at the business, we were listening to what's going on and reduction in BPS. Uh, we were also facing a um, one person, member of staff was retiring. I was getting older <laughs> and creeping towards that point and trying to see where was the business going to go. And um, that was really the start of a, of a bit of a journey. Uh, we have farmed organically since uh, 2005, uh, which was, we went into that at the start of the single farm payment. And um, we, at that point, had a very simple rotation uh, cropping rotation of uh, three cereal crops and two uh, legume crops, grass legume crops. And we had, and in 2017, we had uh, 100 suckler cows, Limousin Angus Cross suckler cows, and we were running a joint venture sheep business with a near neighbor. Uh, we had about a thousand ewes. And so the cows, suckler cows and the sheep were utilizing the legume uh, fertility building crops. Uh, at that point they were all our crops, that, grass crops then were multi-species uh, herbal lays and we've been growing those for probably uh, um, six or seven years before that we started growing herbal lays and switched over relatively quickly. Um, and so in 2016-17, um, a, a neighbour, immediate neighbour to us, was um, uh, looking at a machine, a new drill, that fitted organic cropping. Uh, this was a drill called a chameleon, uh, made in Sweden. And uh, over the fence we got chatting uh, and realised that we were both looking at the same sort of drill and we did some exploratory visits to have a look at that drill working to a farm in Suffolk and um, in that exploratory phase we realized that neither of us could afford the drill on our own and so we started uh, talking about the possibility of sharing that piece of machinery. I had actually shared a combine with the same farmer a few years previous to that for about three or four years and then it stopped. Um, so we, I was used to sharing machinery, I was used to the concept of working with another farm with our joint venture sheep business and so out of the conversation of the drill and travelling up and back to Suffolk a few times getting to know uh, the um, second generation uh, farmer um, who was in his 40s, or just coming up to 40, I, um, I thought there might be an opportunity of doing something a little bit more than just sharing a machine. And I had a sense that it could be a way forward for my boss to um, have a change of managing, for me to gradually step back and do a bit less, and for economies of scale in pooling machinery. And so in 2017-18, we set up our first joint venture with them called Cotswold Organic Growers Limited. And that was an arable joint venture. So we now have three joint ventures with the Phillips family. Uh, so business-wise, it is um, my current boss, uh, who's head of the Hayworth family, um, and Charles Phillips and Sam Phillips. Uh, Sam, who is the son of Charles, who at the original point was about 38, 9, 
and full of enthusiasm, mad on organic farming, uh, passionate about food, and I just felt we might have a good mix. And so that, that was the start. We then ended up um, a few years in, probably two years into our arable joint venture, we started looking, talking about livestock in a more serious way. Uh, with the advent of BPS being reduced, our herbal lays were the weak, weak, weak financial link in the system. So cereal gross margins, you know, if the weather was good, we could get those nearly right, not always. Um, but the fertility building two year phase was more difficult. And also, uh, we had, in the years of just growing cereals and a small number of stock, um, I think we'd depleted some of the fertility in the soil. And we realized we needed more stock. And out of a conversation, we started looking at dairy. And rather than having a fixed dairy, in a set of buildings and the cows just moving within a small distance from that fixed parlour, um, uh, we felt that the right way forward was to go mobile and um, see if we could go down that road. Uh, so that was another um, time of exploring. Uh, we went to a farm in Dorset who had a large mobile dairy um, we looked at another farm near Hungerford just as we were sort of, we'd virtually made our decision. Uh, our big problem was getting a contract for the milk. And so we, in a roundabout way, we ended up uh, in a three-way venture of Brattlegrove Farms, the Phillips's Farm Macaroni Farm, and a farmer in Cornwall, Dave Saunders, uh, who owned cows and had a milk contract. And that was the start of our dairy venture. When we were in the old system, our fertility building, herbal lays, were the poor relation in margin. And so bringing the cows on, that was giving us a much better income or return uh, on the, that herbal lay. When we were running a three crop, two fertility building, uh, that was really all we could afford to keep the herbal lays in the ground because we needed to get back to a cash crop. Because the margin on the dairy is much, much better than beef or sheep, we can afford to stretch the herbal lay rotation. So we're looking at something like four years of herbal lay and then four years of crop or maybe a little bit another year of crop. Um, it is very much a movable feast and, and that's the whole thing about organic farming. It was something we learned very early on you know, you set your pattern and actually it changes within 18 months as things evolve. In, in herbal lays, you have an enormous variety of root system. You know, it is very diverse and actually diversification is what we're really all about in whether it's the herbal lay that we're growing, uh, where you will have grass and uh, chicory, uh, different types of clover, sandfoin, um, then different herbs, plantain, sheep's parsley, uh, salad burnet, um, and they all root differently and they all add something to the system, whether it be soil rooting or grazing for the cows. And, um, and that is really why we, why we like it. And also, in one year, one thing will do well, and it will light the climate and the conditions. And in another year, something else will take over. And actually, when you plant it, as it comes up, you'll see a mix. Legumes are a nitrogen-fixing 
crop. So they're taking the energy from the sun and converting that into nitrogen. And the little nodules, when they break down, they produce, in effect, nitrogen for the grass to benefit from. And it also holes in the soil so that when we change from grass to cereal cropping, we've actually got fertility. But it's not enough on its own. And that is why cows or livestock are so important, because they're converting that into manure, which then gets thrown into the soil, mixed up by the worms, by the bugs and the beetles, and it creates a cycle that enables the farming system to work. Our dairy system, it's a once a day milking system, so it's very low pressure on the cows. Uh, they are only eating grass forage. Uh, at this time of year, they will get a tiny amount of fodder beet if required, but only if required. Otherwise, they are on a, a grass forage based system. They're outside all winter long. Uh, in the winter, they come onto cover crops like this one here, um, and they will move around the, the arable land, which the cover crop will have been planted uh, after harvest, straight after harvest, we go in, uh, direct drill the cover crop in, roll it down, pray for rain, and then it kicks off. And that is our winter feed for the cows. So the cover crop is actually critical to this whole system. Once they've carved, they go on to the proper herbal lays, and we have a system of moving them twice a day. And so they come through the parlor because they know that on the other side is fresh grass. They're used to being moved. Every time they get moved, they know that they're going onto something new and palatable and good. And these, this electric fence here and that one there is the next day's grass for these, or food for these calves. And it's the same principle with the cows. So they will come through, they'll go and have their graze for the main part of the day. In the afternoon, late afternoon, they get moved back onto a night paddock where they spend the night grazing if they want to and then back round through the parlour. And that is what draws them through the parlour. In a conventional um, fixed milking system, to get them through the parlour, people would feed concentrates and, and we don't have to do that. They come quite naturally on their own. The chameleon drill is a exactly what it says really. It is a chameleon, it does different things. So it can either plant and drill a crop or it can harrow the crop um, once it's started to establish and the weeds are growing. We can go through between the rows of corn and harrow the, the weeds out. I'm Sam Phillips, uh, I'm an organic farmer. Um, we farm uh, just outside the village of Eastleach, which is on the Gloucestershire, uh, Wiltshire, Oxfordshire border. Um, I've been back on the farm 12 years. Uh, my farm is Macaroni Farm. Uh, it's a family partnership. Uh, I farm in, in partnership with my father. Uh, we are mixed organic, so um, we we converted to organic in 1999 um, and we grow uh, organic crops so wheat, barley, oats, spelt, rye. We grow cover crops, um, we incorporate herbal layers into our rotation. Um, we have an organic beef enterprise uh, and we have an organic lamb enterprise. Uh, we're also in a, a five-year mid-tier CSS scheme uh, that commenced the 1st of January 2022. In 
2017, I started uh, talking with uh, Charles on Smart from uh, Bradle Grove uh, about um, potentially sharing a, an item of machinery. So we were looking at a system chameleon drill and we couldn't justify buying that drill on our, um, on our own acreage. Uh, so we started talking about how we could potentially join forces, um, make use of our resources, so our machinery and our labor essentially. Uh, and that was 2017. Uh, 2018, we set up Cotswold Organic Growers Limited, which essentially is a uh, machinery and labor sharing JV cooperative. Uh, and that um, JV, the, the JV that I, I manage, um, basically farms all of the land under the Bradle Grove umbrella and also the Macaroni Farm umbrella. So Macaroni Farm now is about 2,000 acres. Uh, Bradle Grove is about two and a half. So all in, we're about four and a half thousand acres and it's all ring fenced. Um, soil types, predominantly Cotswold Brash. Uh, we have a bit of uh, better ground. Um, but I would say 80, 85% Cotswold Brash. So the benefits um, that, that, that we've seen in the last four years, um, there's a few. The first one that really sort of sticks out and, and was probably the reason why we went down this route was, was obviously financial reasons. So we couldn't justify a combine. We had a contractor in doing that. Bradle Grove owned a combine, but was probably not doing the acreage to to justify having it, you know, having a combine on their own. Um, so the real saving, I suppose, at the moment, and the real sort of standout is the fact that we have reduced our fixed costs considerably. Uh, and that is, you know, that going forward, you take BPS out of the equation, that's a huge part of of you know what we're doing and what we're trying to do. Uh, we run a very very low input uh, system. Um, uh, and trying to get tractors and combines um, for, as, for as cheap as possible is, makes a really big difference when you're working on a, on a large acreage. And the beauty of having the large, large acreage is that we can spread our fixed costs. So we can make use of economies of, stick, of scale. Um, and, and that's really probably the, 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 the main reason we did it. Um, the second reason was because and we didn't really know this until we started talking, but, but Charles uh, and Reggie, uh, Reggie the owner, uh, and myself and my father, we have a very, we, we, we still do, but at the time of talking about five years ago, we had a very similar vision as, as to where we wanted to get to with the land. Um, we both wanted to stay organic, both, both partnerships wanted to stay organic. Um, it was very much about building soil, um, really, really high welfare of, of livestock, um, capturing as much carbon as, as, as we could, increasing biodiversity through, uh, through CSS and at the time it was HLS. And so, you know, we, we sat around a table and we, 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 we had very, very similar objectives. Uh, and, and from that, it was this whole knowledge share which came from it. And, and that has been, certainly for me, it's been a, a, a fantastic journey of, you know, bouncing ideas off. You know, we both see ourselves as quite progressive people. We don't want to you know, we want to move with the times, we want to embrace change, we want to take use of um, opportunities. So that has been a great exercise in, in that we have, you know, we are trying things that are maybe a little bit left field uh, and progressive, um, but that's the nature of, of what we do. Um, so secondly, it would be, it would be knowledge share. Uh, and, then, and then thirdly, it's this whole idea and notion of succession. You know, Charles is wanting to do less, I'm wanting to do more. Uh, and, and it just worked well with also my father wanting to do less as well. Um, so I've now, I've now been involved uh, with, you know, with Bradle Grove for about five years, um, which has been great. 2019, we sat down and we were looking at the, the broader picture, if you like, uh, and because of the herbal lay element within our rotation, which essentially is the fertility building stage, um, we wanted to make sure that when the land was in a herbal lay, we were still making money. We were adamant that we wanted to be profitable without subsidy. You know, that was one of the principles when we, when we set up the JV and when we were talking about longer term goals. Um, and so we, we looked at uh, uh, what, we were, what we were doing at the time. We, had, we still had the ar organic arable, but we were running a very traditional organic suckler beef herd. 
um, both at Macaroni and also at Brattle Grove. Uh, and, and that really wasn't making any money. Uh, we were set stocking. Uh, we were housing for six to seven months. We were betting on organic straw that was worth about 100, well, at the time probably 90 pound a ton. Uh, and we were feeding silage through lots of machinery, lots of labor. It was, it was an expensive time of year. And you know, essentially we were only getting a calf or a, or a fat animal out of each animal, out of each cow every year. So we decided to, to sell our suckler, suckler herds and we were looking at, at an alternative enterprise that was going to tick all the boxes with regards to soil, biodiversity and finance. Uh, and we ended up uh, setting up a, another JV with a, with a, with a Cornish dairy farmer um, and, and because of the, the size of the land, if you like, we didn't want to have a fixed dairy, we didn't want to have a fixed parlour. We wanted to spread as much fertility over the four and a half thousand acres as we, as we could. So we looked at a mobile uh, milking system, so we've got a, a 2448 um, herringbone Waikato milking system on a, essentially a, a triaxle flatbed trailer uh, and that follows the cows around the grazing platform. We're, we're currently still in a field called Barnlands, the cows were in here until about three or four days ago. Um, they have this year about 750 acres um, which is all the adjacent, land, adjacent um, fields with, with, with the same herbal lay mix which we'll look at in a minute. and. Um, and, and, and so the cows, they, get, they, milk, they milk in the morning, uh, they then go on to fresh pasture, and then in the afternoon they go on to another fresh pasture, so they're mo being moved twice a day, and then they're milked again in the morning and then the same again. And then the parlor moves off to the, to the next block. Uh, and, and that has been a, it's been a very, we're, we're seeing a lot of benefit. It's been a very, setting up in, in COVID was, was hard uh, and quite stressful. Uh, but we're now really seeing the benefit um, of the dairy to the land uh, and, and how the land is, is recovering and regenerating um, through mob grazing, um, through grazing a third, trampling a third, leaving a third, um, you know, longer rest periods. Uh, it's, it's amazing how in a year the land has transformed. So we're in a field called Barnlands. Uh, we're right on the, on the northern tip of the, of the grazing platform. Uh, it's about 10 hectares in, in size, uh, and it's in a, in a herbal lay. This mix came from Cotswold Seeds. Uh, it was a mix that Ian, Sam Lane, and myself formulated. Uh, and it's made up of lots of different grasses, legumes, herbs, um, there's a high percentage of samphoin. We like putting a lot of samphoin in our mixes. Um, red, white clover, birds for trefoil, uh, a few annual legumes. We've got a little bit of Persian, a little bit of um, crimson that, that now has, has died off. And then all the grasses. It's, it's, it's high in Coxfoot, high in Timothy, high in red fescue. And then it's got the meadow fescues. It's got a little bit of rye grass. Um, it's got a bit of meadow stalk. Uh, and it's, um, it's coming into its third year. And, and, it, and it's improving all the time. You know, the herbal lays, what I'm seeing from a, an observation point of view is every year you see a plant species that is prominent. Um, this year out here, it's been more chicory and, and, and samphoin, whereas you go to other bits of, of the grazing platform and you're seeing um, more ryegrass and white clover. And the mix is exactly the same, but it just, it's how it, it behaves on different soil types in different, if, in different years. But this has, uh, so if you were, the la your last vi visit was, was March, we will have probably grazed it two or three times in, in that period. So we're, 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 the rest periods at the moment are anything between 25 and, and 45, 50 days, are typically around the 40 day mark, um, obviously depending on weather and grass growth. Uh, and it looks a little bit untidy and, uh, and, and unkept if you like, uh, it's a very different, it's not what we were used to previously when we were, uh, you know, we had our suckler cows and we had our sheep. As soon as the animals came out, we would then top it, we would reset it, uh, and we would try and encourage new growth. Now what we're trying to do is we're trying to create more of a thatch, uh, more, more sort of protection, if you like, in all of this um, ungrazed chicory and grasses and legumes 
it's creating this this thatch effect on the on, on the top of the on the top of the ground, protecting the soil, trying to retain all the moisture. Um, at the same time, we've got new growth coming through. So it, it's a different way of thinking, and it goes back to what I said earlier about the whole um, graze a third, trample a third, leave leave a third, and and. And having read about that and heard, heard it in so many presentations and now actually doing it ourselves, I can really see the benefit of it. So it, it's, um, it's amazing how quickly the land is recovering. You know, okay, we, we were running an organic system beforehand, but we were set stocking, we were grazing much tighter. Um, and we felt that we were probably taking more out of the ground than putting back. So myself and my partners see the next sort of five, 10 years as a real, building phase um, and, and, and hopefully in doing that we're producing lots of amazing food uh, at the same time. This mix is a, um, is a mix that I put together with, with Sam and Ian from Cotswold Seeds and, and the process really starts back in, well it's the end of the year really, so normally we would, we would under sow a, a herbal lay into a, uh, a nurse cereal crop and the, the process really starts as soon as, the, as soon as it goes in the ground, we monitor it, we see what, what, what has vigor. We, we learn from our mistakes in that if we, if, we, if we put a plant species in that we, we're not seeing come through or that's not thriving, that doesn't have the vigor, then we'll try and leave it out. But we are trying to get away from this whole idea of monoculture. We're trying to mimic nature. We're trying to um, increase plant diversity and plant species with all the benefit that that gives to the soil and, 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 and improving soil health. So I go to Sam and Ian, sort of November, December time, start thinking about um, our seed mix uh, and what area we're gonna, we're gonna need uh, and, and what, what seed rate and, and what, what, um, what volume we're gonna need. Um, and it typically starts using the previous mix as a template and then going through that, talking through the grasses, talking through the legum, legumes, talking through the herbs uh, and, and really just going through, you know, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, and then from there I go back to, to Sam and he, he formulates and he comes back um, with, with a mix and, and there's a few tweaks um, and then, and then it, it miraculously appears which is fantastic and it's always big excitement when you know and it's so reliant that the dairy gets the best out of these herbal lays so we can't we don't want to mess it up and so actually what we've done this year is um, the next block that's coming into the grazing platform next year um, we seeded the spring oats uh, and then we rolled it with Cambridge rolls and then we harrowcombed the, the small seeds on and then Cambridge rolled it again all within 24 hours and so now you've got a, you've got you've got the spring oats which are sort of waist height but you've also got the herbal lay the understory the the, the the plants with the most vigor so mainly at this time of year it's we're seeing the red clovers. There's not a huge amount of red clover in the mix, but we're seeing the red clovers really come up through the crop. There is then the worry that you, you know, when you go in with the combine, you know, are you gonna have the red clover, you know, climbing out the top of the crop? That is a risk that, and, and it has happened to us, and it's a risk that we are willing to take because we really understand the value of getting good establishment. Yes, it might give the combine driver a bit of a headache, but it's, it's worth that headache. Uh, or we feel it's worth that headache. Um, and so I'm, I'm really hopeful that this will probably be our preferred method going forward. Um, so we will, we will drill and seed her, the herbal lay mix all at the same time. And then we will combine. And then ideally you then, you know, you let the light in as soon as you take that nurse crop off. And we don't reduce the seed rate to the nurse crop. You know, we run at full rates for the barley and also the oats. People use rye because it's nice and tall so you don't, don't get the, the issue of the the crop coming out the bottom. Um, but we've simplified our rotation. We've only got a very small amount of rye in the rotation. This ground, it's, it's Cotswold brash, it's very free draining, it's very susceptible to, to, to drought. Uh, it's good spring barley ground. Um, and there's some spring barley across the way which is, which is looking really healthy. Um, but that's really what, what I've noticed in the 12 years that I've been back on the farm. And a lot of what we do, if you want to, if you want to call it regen or conservation ag, a lot of it's about observation and, and trying different things. And you know, I, 
I often get things wrong, but as long as you don't make that same mistake again and you're constantly progressing and constantly learning, then you know what's not to what's not to like. Um, but yeah, I know the I'm sure the, the herbal lay mix will change again next year. Um, but that's part of you know part of the, the you know every day is a school day. So this field uh, for the next few months um, will it will obviously re remain as a, as a herbal lay. Um, it's in the in the third block within the within the eight blocks on the, on the farm. Um, it will remain down typically for four years. Uh, it will then be uh, cultivated and we will grow cereals for two, three, four years, depending on the on the field. Um, and that rotation is constantly changing depending on markets and um, and and. and <laughs> and whether we feel that we can stretch the rotation to four crops. Um, it also depends on enterprise, on how much herbal lay the, the, the dairy wants. So we have a, we have a sort of blueprint in, in our mind, but it does change on a, on, a, on a sort of monthly basis. But typically, you know, we tell people that we have an eight year rotation. The, the farm, both farms are split into eight blocks. Um, the dairy has four blocks and the arable enterprise has four blocks. And then on macaroni, it's the same again, the, um, the cows and the sheep, so the beef and the sheep have four blocks and the, and the arable has four blocks. And, so, and then it rotates. So every year a new block's coming into the dairy and then and another one's coming out. So we're building the soil, the soil and, we're, and we're then using that fertility. And then we go through the building stage again. But instead of trying to be sustainable, whereby you are literally building, using, building, using, building, using, we're trying to build, use a little bit, build more, use a little bit, build more. So in the back of our minds, that's really, you know, what we're trying to achieve. Um, but we're we're passionate about producing really good food, uh, and and that can't be forgotten. Um, and, and 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 this is the way in which we've chosen to farm. And we think it suits the land and, and this environment, you know, well. So we are we're standing in a field called uh, Great Stanmore. Um, we have the the dairy cows behind us. Um, we're currently milking about 320 cows uh, once a day uh, through a, a mobile parlour, um, which is positioned over my left shoulder. Um, and the cows are getting moved twice a day, so. Uh, they milk f at first light, so between sort of 5.30 and 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they then come on to, to, to clean, fresh pasture. And then in the afternoon, um, about 3, 3, 4 o'clock, they move to their evening pasture, uh, where they get ready for the, for the following morning's milking. Um, the breed is typically, there's a lot of Jersey in, in the breed. Uh, they're very, very small cow, really. Uh, they're outside all year round. Um, they're on a 100% uh, forage diet, so no hard feed, no concentrates. Um, they're fed a little bit of, uh, of fodder beet um, in, the, in, the, in the sort of post-carving. Um, uh, they are, again, they've probably, uh, they've probably grazed this three times already this season. Um, so we've seen some really, really good regrowth um, in these herbal lay mixes. And you can get a feel for what it looks like where it hasn't been grazed. You know, we're seeing a lot of the red clover, uh, bird's foot trefoil, obviously the chicory is everywhere. Um, and then we've got the rye grasses, we've got the timothies, um, we've got some coxford in here as well. Um, so it looks very different from, from, the, from the previous field that we were standing in. Um, but the same effect, you can see the trampling effect that we're, that we're leaving behind. Uh, and really the cows are just taking the best leaf, the best bit of, of greenery that they want. They're, you know, they're picking and choosing. Uh, and then they're moving on to the, to, the, to the next bit. So the bird's foot trefoil makes up, I think about four or 5% of the, of the mix. Um, it is fantastic in that it produces this beautiful little yellow flower. Sometimes it has a bit of red or orange. Uh, other name is eggs and bacon. Um, so it's a legume, so it fixes atmospheric nitrogen in the soil. Uh, it's very, very high in protein. It's very drought resistant. So we're currently, we haven't seen any rain here for about a month. Um, and you drive around uh, the ground that, or, or, the, or the paddocks that haven't been grazed for 30, 40 days. And the one plant, okay, if you take chicory out of it, 
the one plant that's really, really prominent is bird's foot trefoil. So it's something, when I was talking earlier about observations and feeding back to, to, to Ian and to Sam, this is something that's going to appear on my next list in that I want to try and create a, a mix that has more bird's foot trefoil in, maybe something like lucerne, maybe something like uh, samphoin, maybe a little bit of chicory, a little bit of, um, a little bit of plantain, uh, and try and create a, a drought buster mix. You know, so we, we are seeing these extremes now, uh, and it would be nice to think that we could, we could formulate a mix that really thrives in, in these dry, dry spells. Um, maybe a little bit of Coxford as well, just to add a, add a grass in there. Little, maybe a little bit of chick, uh, Timothy as well. Um, but yeah, no, de definitely Bird's Foot Treffle is one, is one of my favourites. You can see in the margin, it's absolutely, you know, it's prominent and it's, it's doing really well. Um, and, and the animals love it. Um, it's got some, some good tannins in it, so the cattle do really, really well on it. They really, really like it. They, they go into a field and they, they go for the, uh, the Bird's Foot Treffle first. We are standing in a field called uh, Lower Downs. Uh, currently got a field of Isabel spring oats that we're growing um, for seed. Uh, this is the first time we've grown it. I'm really happy with how it looks at the moment. It's got a good, a good weight to it. Um, nice, clean flag leaf. Um, so it looks, it looks really, really promising. Um, it was drilled with the chameleon, um, 250 mil spacings. Um, seed rate, uh, we were running at about 375 seeds per square meter. Um, and this followed, this is a third crop in the rotation. So it was spelt, then it was barley, now it's spring oats. And winter 21-22, we bale grazed the dairy cows. So in February, when the dairy cows were dry, um, we bale grazed them. So they were out here for 10 days. So in doing that, they've actually, you know, really, really helped with the fertility. We're obviously now getting to the end of the arable rotation. So we're, you know, we're, we, we've used quite a lot of the, of, the, of the fertility already, but the cows have really just injected that life back into the soil. And you can see it looks a little bit uneven, but that's from where the, where the fertility is. So on the whole, I'm really happy with this. This field had a herbal layer in it about three years ago. Um, and that was when we were set stocking pre-dairy. Um, but, you know, we have been growing herbal lays on the farm for the best part of 10, 12 years. So going forward, uh, we, we have spring oats now. We might have one more crop in 2023 that will then be under sown and then it will go back into a herbal lay. So this field is destined for a herbal lay in probably spring 2024. We are standing in a field called Upper Bymore. Um, I'm on a divide between some spring oats on my left and some fodder beet on my right. Um, the fodder beet is for winter grazing. Uh, the spring oats are for combining. So these spring oats will go for, for milling. They're a variety called Canyon. Um, the fodder beet is a variety called, called Geronimo. Uh, and once, the, once the, the, the oats has been harvested, uh, we will then plant a, a multi-species cover crop in place of the oats, which will then hopefully grow through the autumn winter. Uh, and then once the fodder beet has reached its you know, potential, we will then strip graze it. So we will start at one end and every day the, the cattle will have a, a fresh break. Um, and then next year, this whole field will go into spring barley. So the cows will typically come on post Christmas. Uh, we would hope there'd be about 30 days worth of, of grazing out here. Um, if we need to buffer it and we need to slow the cows down, you know, if we're running out of food, then we can always supplement feed with, with bales. Um, and you can actually see where the bales were previously, um, where it has that sort of little ridge and, ridge and furrow effect. So we actually outwintered on, on here last winter as well. Um, prior to that, um, we had uh, a crop of winter oats, then it was spring barley, now we're into spring oats. And then prior to the winter oats, we were in the herbal lay. So the herbal lay was in the ground again for probably three years. 
and that was in the, the crossover between the sucklers and, and the dairy. So we actually carved the dairy cows in here for the first time in spring 2021. Um, and it was great because we've obviously got shelter from the wood um, and it was a nice big free draining open field.